Well, Coca-Cola continues to sell more uh, uh, drinks, a uh, wider portfolio than they used to have many years ago, uh, more every year than the year before. But the growth rate uh, in carbonated soft drinks 20 years ago was a lot greater than, than it is today. It, it's still, it, it's still st very strong. I mean, it, I think they sell like 1.9 billion eight ounce servings of some drink every day. And a, a lot of that's Coca-Cola. Uh, so it's, it's a very good business, but the growth rate has slowed down considerably from where it was, we'll say, 20 years ago. Uh, we, we know that um, the company just recently announced that it's stepping up the restructuring of its North American operations. It's trying to push ahead um, the move to get out of Coca-Cola bottlers. Yeah. Uh, is that the right move? Well, it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, I mean, they, they, they bought uh, up the bottling operations, I don't know, five or six years ago with the idea of refranchising them later on. So, I mean, this is part of a plan. Uh, they drifted, in 1899, for a dollar, they made a deal with three guys from Chattanooga. It was the dumbest deal ever made. They, they gave, in perpetuity, the rights in, in almost the entire United States of these guys for the bottling operation. And that led to all kinds of things over time. Then those fellows made sub-arrangements and all that sort of thing. Working their way out of that, it started 40 or 50 years ago, and my friend Don Keogh had a big part of the job. And, they, as he said, he, he loved and threatened and cajoled and pleaded and <laughs> all these things to try and get this thing into a more logical arrangement. And they've been working on that for a long time. And this is part of a very long-term plan to have the most logical distribution system that fits today's retailing. I mean, there weren't Walmarts and those around 100 mm -hmm. years ago. So you had local accounts entirely then. Now you have big national accounts. And it's a different world. But it's been expensive, been very expensive to reconfigure the distribution arrangement. Well, it was the purchase of CCE, Coca-Cola Enterprises. Was that the right move back in 2010? They probably felt it was the only move to, but they created CCE, of course, 20 years earlier. I mean, it, it's been a tough problem to align the interests of the bottlers and the constant, they call it concentrate manufacturing part of it. And, and it's, it's different by different countries. It's, it's not an easy puzzle. But they had decided that to have the United States, in particular, more logically configured, reinvigorated in terms of the bottling partners they might have and so on. They've got a terrific bottler, for example, that they've added in Chicago. I know the people. Uh, so the, the, the scorecard isn't in on it. They paid a lot of money, and they're not going to get back that much money, it doesn't look to me like, in terms of when they refranchise it. But that isn't really the key. The real key is, is is how vigorous the system is once it's been put in place. And they've accelerated the timetable for getting it refranchised. The company named a new president and chief operating officer, right. James Quincy, back in August. Do you know him? I, I met him once, and I've got a, a, a dinner coming up with him here pretty soon. Everything I know about him is good. Okay. Uh, there's a question from a viewer that comes in asking, this is from Shop 2 Friends. Um, Will 3G buy Coca-Cola in the next few years? I don't think so. <laughs> no, Coca-Cola is not for sale. And, you and would, I would say this: we own nine percent of it, so we might have a little bit to, to say to in do that. With it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, okay, let's let's turn our attention and ask a little bit about American Express. This is another question from a viewer, Dave Carson, who writes in: How do you rationalize Berkshire's continued investment in American Express given its troubles? Well, American Express. It started, I think, in 1851, and they had an express business. You, you transported goods from the west coast, the east coast to the west coast. I think they even chained the Pony Express rider to his trunk that he was carrying so that if the Indians came, he couldn't run off and leave the trunk. And then along came the railroad, and now all of a sudden you can stick those trunks on, on, on a railroad. And American Express adapted to money orders. And then the credit card came along in the 1950s, and people said money orders could disappear, and they adapted to credit cards. Diners Club looked like they were going to wipe them off the face of the earth for a short period of time. So it's been a business that's had to adapt, but it's, it's been a very fundamental business with a terrific reputation. And I, during when Roosevelt closed the banks in 1933, traveler's checks were allowed to be continued to be used, so they substituted for banks even for a week or so. So it, and. Ken Chenault has been terrific. 
about adapting in a world where you need to adapt very quickly. But you've got you've got cardholders spending sixteen or seventeen thousand dollars per person against you know four thousand or so on Visa, and it's a very it's a very very strong brand. But you are going to have all kinds of people coming at you in payments. And that won't stop. I mean, it'll be this thing today and another thing tomorrow, and so you've got PayPal. You've got the whole works. I think American Express will do fine over time. The Costco breakup of the Costco arrangement was a big deal, but the proprietary cards stay as strong as ever and keep growing, and I, I, I like it fine, but there's no question it'll have an abundance of competition. The company's going through a restructuring as well, uh, American Express, and people have been told to, to warn that you could have some up and down uh, quarters as you go through this, as they spend more on marketing to maybe bring more people in, more members into the cards. You're prepared to ride that out? Well, sure. I mean, I, I, I wrote out the salad oil scandal <laughs> in the 1960s. No, American Express, they bought Fireman's Fund Insurance. They tried to build a broker's thing around Shearson. I mean, they'll make... They'll make mistakes. They owned IDS and they they spun it off at one. You know, it, 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 but they have the sense to evolve and they keep evolving toward their strengths. And uh, you know, I've I've got a card in my pocket that I got in 1964, and and it serves my purposes very well. But it doesn't serve everybody's purposes, and they will keep adapting to that. They've come up with lots of new products, so it's competitive. But I like the business. Of the big four investments, we have um, talked about already American Express, Coca-Cola, IBM. We have not touched on Wells Fargo. That's, and that's the, been one of that's the, better the biggest one, too. It's the biggest one, and it's the best performing stock if you're looking at those four over the last year or so. What, talk a little bit about Wells Fargo. Well, it's a there. terrific operation, and John Stuff has done a great job. I, I keep trying to... He's talking about retiring at 65, and I, I'm going to go out and have a hunger strike in front of the director's <laughs> meeting if they do that. But uh, he's done a fabulous job. And Wells, Wells, you know, it's a very big. I mean, it's a company that makes 20 billion dollars a year, plus after tax, and, and uh, it's in I don't know how many households, but it, it's it's a very well-run bank. It, uh, it when the when the crisis hit, you know, it took over what I think was then the fourth largest bank, Wachovia. The government didn't have to come up with a penny. You know, I mean, stockholders bought some more stock, but, but Wells was there to take over Wachovia at a time when the world was falling apart. And it didn't have to go to the FDIC, it didn't have to go to the federal government. Uh, so it, it, they've done a terrific job. You also mentioned Bank of America in the annual letter. It's right. not one of your big four holdings, although you mentioned that well, if, you, it was, mm -hmm. it, if it was converted, it would be your fourth largest equity yeah. investment. Yeah. No, Bank of America, I mean, uh, Brian Moynihan has done a great job. I mean, he, he inherited a bad hand. I mean, they had, when you look at Countrywide and, and when Merrill Lynch was acquired on that Sunday, for, I don't know, around $30 a share. If they'd waited a day or two, it probably been 30 cents a share. <laughs> but, yeah, so uh, Ryan really took on a tough problem. He had all these mortgage problems inherited from the past, that, and he had the government mad at him, and he had a bit of the populace mad at him. And he's, he, I mean, he just took it one thing at a time, and he's, he's made improvements, dramatic improvements, and I think it's very, very likely we've got these warrants that expire in a few years, and I think very, very likely we, we, we uh, exercise those and, and remain a very large shareholder of I think we'd own about 7% of the company or something like that, and, and uh, uh, I think that'll happen. 